we're going to talk about the 55 56 Parkhurst set, the hockey set. And one of the things about it is that it basically has not exactly a parallel, but it has a parallel version of the set that was distributed in a different way with the Quaker Oats. And part of this discussion is the Quaker Oats is much rarer and harder to come by with the distribution method, but also it's become as a result of that and the way it was distributed and all that, it's trickier to figure stuff out. So a lot of this discussion is ways of investigating and learning more things about it. And this is where Natan is going to kind of come into play. So why don't we start with that? So Natan, why don't you share with us a little bit of uh, your thoughts and how this led into it and what you were working on? Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me and really appreciate being able to talk to other people who might be interested <laughs> in something that I've really had a deep dive into the last year or so. Uh, I've always been a huge hockey fan and uh, I've been collecting the 1955 Parkers set now for about 15 years. Uh, I And like a lot of people, I didn't necessarily know a lot about um, the set. I just jumped in, started buying uh, PSA cards, built a really great set, but then started really wanting to understand what I was seeing. I, a lot of sense about uh, uh, whether it was just the way in which the cards presented in holders or in the marketplace where I would see discrepancies between the cards that I had and other people had. So um, that last, I'm I'm also somebody that really likes to get to the bottom of things that I'm interested in. So last spring, COVID's uh, in full force. And uh, I just thought, um, I've got a few miscut cards here uh, where there's obviously another card next to it. Uh, is, there an uncut, is there an uncut sheet? Mm -hmm. And I started looking for an uncut sheet. I, I found a classic auctions uh, uncut sheet from 1960-63, looked at it, I studied the the makeup. It's 242 cards uh, equally situated on a left and a right side in 121 card uh, panels. Part of this also was that there was a Harry Lumley, which is one of the toughest cards to find in the set, that was auctioned off as a PSA seven, mm -hmm. um, and it didn't have. It was it had a miscut back, but it didn't have a miscut red arrow, and. Uh, for the life of me, I'd never seen anything like it. So that was the other impetus for me to start to figure out what is actually going on. Um, is, are all of Harry Lumley's the same? Are there some that are that don't have a miscut red arrow next to uh, the, uh, on the next card in the sheet? Or was this alteration? You know, I did almost immediately find the Harry Lumley that had that that card was alterated from. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was relatively quick that I could find an actual um, uh, ex um, evidence that it was the same card, just the red arrow had been erased and been graded as a PSA 7 anyway. Okay. But that really wasn't why I got into this at all. Uh, I got into this because I was finding uh, these miscut cool cards and I, I wanted to know if I could piece it together. Uh, right away, I went to the experts, the people that I that I felt would know. Um, uh, nobody had seen a 55 Parkhurst uncut sheet, and um, and so I just started amassing a database of all of the the 79 cards in the set. Um, each one of them, trying to understand how I could understand who was next to that card, because mm -hmm. there's so many miscut cards in that set. And over time, it was like a, a, a mystery that unraveled sometimes really fast. And other times it took me a couple of months to figure out the next step. But it was over six months that I uncovered all of the uncut sheet. And then uh, Bobby and I uh, connected and we figured out the Parkhurst and the Quaker Oats uh, versions of the sheets. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, um, a a light back version of the set. And all of those things together came, um, well, allowed me to then say that I definitively um, know that the 121 card sheet from 1955-56 Parkhurst was what had um, uh, some, uh, some that were printed twice and some that were printed once. Mm -hmm. And that um, it would be very hard for any of us to improve upon what has been done uh, unless an actual uncut sheet comes to comes to the hobby 
Right. So quickly, I'll just uh, chime in on this. And the the background there that you establish is important because that was the old school way that it happened, that a lot of these discoveries happen, is that collectors talk to each other, they compare notes, they look. Now, we have technology now where we can try to piece it together that way. We can find images and do it. But the but if you go back way, 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 way to the beginning, where the Jefferson Burdicks was working with fellow collectors at that time, they didn't have that luxury. It's like, can you send me can you send me a scan? <laughs> you know, in, well, it wasn't even a scan. Can you send me a photocopy? <laughs> photocopy basically because and you had to deal with black and white this is all you got so and and that's how you tried to piece it together we have some technology now that makes certain parts of it way easier the person doesn't have to give up their card or do a crummy black and white scan we've got obviously hga is confirmed we theoretically have the ability to, to give you high resolution images in some cases which can be super helpful but it's these collectors comparing notes and putting the pieces together that helps build that up but the concept technology notwithstanding the concept stays the same because in isolation it's just really hard to figure it out when there's it's not like anybody wrote it down it's not like they gave you no. the the roadmap to follow to get from point a to point b you have to you have to do your own journey and you have to chase these things down yeah it's it's interesting in the first spring of um of covid there in, in 2020 uh nathan gives me an email he said bobby i'm gonna work on uh, the sheet uh do you have any information on the sheet or anything and he says i'm trying to piece it together and i just went i'm working on the book and i'm going Okay, have at it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get back to me on that. I, I, mean, I got too many fish to fry here. So uh, so then he contacted me a little later. So mm -hmm. it was interesting. But you can finish that up. Uh, you can yeah. go with that uh, anytime. Yeah. So before, so what we'll do here is I know you've got some stuff to share, and I'll, I'll let you have background in it. But uh, kind of to Bobby's point, though, we all have our journeys to do, and sometimes we have to take them in different paths. What I want to do is I want to introduce a person to come into the, to, to come onto the stream here now. And then we'll have a little bit more of a conversation later. This was the other guest that potentially I was going to include. Oh, wonderful. So some of you may be familiar with this guy, Bob Lewis. Mr. How's it going, Bob? Bobby, Carlos, Matan, how are you guys? So Great. Bobby already did the hat backwards joke. So oh. <laughs> yeah, he had it down. He, he even had a logo hat, man. Come on. I know. I, I just have a, you know, triple A baseball team on this hat. So. The important, the important thing though is I do kind of appreciate over your shoulder the the image of a of a of a very famous person in the background uh, there. I it was just came net very natural. I didn't set that up at all. Yeah, it just showed up. That's right, exactly. <laughs> so what I'll do is Bob. What we're going to do is uh, part of the reason I invited Bob is because he hadn't been on a while, so I wanted to kind of have an opportunity to chat with Bob on some of the stuff. And part of the and part of the reason I brought him on also is that we're going to have a little chat with him after because he is going to be participating in Hobby Palooza. So there is oh. so the, so the, there is. Don't expect this in future episodes, but there is a rhyme or reason to pretty much everything we're doing tonight. So, yeah, so everything, everything's actually been programmed pretty well. So what I want to do, Bob, is hang tight and hang out, and then uh, let's let Natan get continue with his presentation, and then we'll uh, and then we'll let him go check out the hockey game because he wants to have the opportunity to run off. So we'll give him a chance. So go ahead, Natan. Please continue. All right. Yeah. So uh, just basically, I'm I'm going to try to get this as as concise as I possibly can. Go for it. But um, the in 1955-56, um, Parker set 79 cards, just Montreal and Toronto. And for my for most of my collecting life, I thought that the Quaker Oat set, which is also 79 cards, was a, you know an afterthought of the Parker set. That it was a serial premium, and um, you know uh, Parker's made some money by just allowing for them to make different backs because they're green backs with just Parker's, or just Quaker Oats um, uh, on them. But, you know, Bobby's research has uh, uh, completely flipped that on its head. Uh, so actually the Quaker Oats came first. And the all of the strange, odd things in this 1955-56 uh, Parker's sheet come from the considerations of the Quaker Oats set. Uh, so the rarity of Rocket Richard, Harry Lumley, and uh, King Clancy, those were um, the super short prints in the Quaker Oats. And uh, one of the first things that I found when I was looking at the Harry Lumley was next to that Harry Lumley was the uh, miscut red arrow of Rocket Richard. Mm -hmm. I found very quickly that each of the backs of, of the cards, especially there's a red arrow, did you know, um, segment, they're, they're unique on each one of those 54 cards that have those red arrows. So I could match up 
that it was Rocket Richard next to um, Harry Lumley. Then, because there's so many miscut cards, I could match up that King Clancy was next to um, Rocket Richard. So immediately, very early on, there was this idea that that the three most difficult cards to find in the 1950s from one set um, are sitting right next to each other on the sheet. Also, that they didn't appear anywhere else in the sheet. Right. So I'm going to share. I'm going to share uh, my. Uh, camera now to show you what I'm talking about Perfect. and how I got to this idea that there are 121 cards on the sheet, even though there's 79 um, cards and that the summer are printed once and some are printed twice. Mm -hmm. yeah. good. I'm just going to fill in a, a little gap for maybe the people who don't understand the set is that uh, Quaker Oats, when they put out the set, there was prizes awarded for sending in partial sets or a full set. And uh, at that time, you could send in uh, to get uh, a crest, a couple crests, and then there was a pair of skates and a bicycle. So the bicycle was the biggest prize. And um, and that's where the the Harry Lumley and the three short prints that we're talking about come into play on this. So that that's why they're so short printed is because the bigger prizes were awarded if you had those cards. Now we can go on. Go ahead, Nathan. So those cards, there's only five or six known of each. Uh, the Harry Lumley, the... Um, uh, the King Clans, it, they're just so hard to find. But this story gets very interesting towards the end. Uh, so there's quite an interesting part of this story that uh, Bobby, what were, the, get to. what were the crests that you were part of the prizes? It was a Toronto Montreal, a Toronto Montreal set because Parker's only had Toronto Montreal at that time. Okay. Uh, so they would give you a Toronto crest and a Montreal crest if you just sent them any 20 cards, uh, something okay. like that. I think it's 20, is it not? I can't remember everything verbatim, but uh, yeah. So every kid was mailing away. But if you save this many cards, they would you could get a pair of skates. Or if you said this many cards, you could get uh, uh, the skates was the big prize. Uh, the bicycle was the big prize. So the last one was the bicycle. So if, to get a bicycle, that would be awesome back in 1955. You know, yeah. just for sending some cards in. So as you were saying, Nathan, uh, based on what you were finding, you were starting to do the research. You were starting to dig into it. You were finding the different markings that were helping you put the pieces together. Basically, we're doing a jigsaw puzzle, effectively, because we're looking for certain markings and things to separate them out, and we're trying to rebuild this sheet because nobody right. knows what it looks like anymore. You know, nobody probably alive. So now you're basically trying to reconstruct it based on the markings. So you got the Tim Horn here. Great. So as you can see, um, I've highlighted in black that on the uh, right where the border comes in and the left where the border comes in, there's a little dip on the left and there's an elevation on the right. So that isn't just a print defect for one particular card. That is, um, that's the way that that particular card was made. Uh, here is then another. So you can see there isn't a dip on either side. And there's also then kind of a jagged red edge uh, on the bottom. So those no matter what Tim Horton's card that you own or have ever seen with 55 Parkhurst or Quaker Oats, one of those two red borders will, will exist. That meant that there were two examples of Tim Horton within the particular sheet. Right. And so here's, and here's what I was talking about earlier with the miscut red borders. A lot of the Parkhurst cards have uh, this common defect. That particular red border, uh, or uh, uh, did you know, uh, miscut arrow, mm -hmm. is specific to Sid Smith. So no other red arrow looks like that under magnification. So that to tells me that Sid Smith was to the left of Tim Horton, and that also Sid Smith was um, uh, right next to it on the sheet. The other interest, I'm, I'm. Um, just using Tim Horton's uh, cards because it, it it's an, exil an example that holds true for all the rest of the cards. Mm -hmm. Here's um, a light back Tim Horton, and it is uh, also something in the 55 set that's really interesting. There's a strange light back version of it. And Tim Horton is also one of uh, 
the only card or the only card that we know of that has a significant error that has been corrected by Parkhurst. And you can see in this particular version that the defense you can where which was inverted in the error, you can actually see where it's been corrected. And that isn't something that I don't uh, that anyone has really talked about in the hobby. The other important thing on this particular card is that this is uh, the second version that I showed. You can see with the um, um, not the lower and upper corners of the red border, but the jagged edge along the bottom. So this particular card can only be found um, uh, in in this particular um, variation. So the other variation, the one that has the up and down on the right hand side, that was the same as the Quaker Oats versions. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was these this was the uh, the real breakthrough that I could go through and catalog every single example of all 79 cards, and I also knew that there was a Quaker Oats sheet, and then there was also a separate sheet that was uh, the light back sheet. So there were two separate. 121 card sheets and the hardest thing to do out of all this was then to recreate that jigsaw puzzle from scratch without mm -hmm. necessarily knowing where it started and ended um, but uh, every uh, there were a million clues uh, but here's the basic premise that uh, there are either two or four versions of each of the 79 55 parkers cards and that um, the quaker oats only contains one or two of those versions, and then the light backs only contains one or two of those versions. They never mix. So we understand that Quaker Oats worked off of basically one sheet. So they were the first sheet. They were the, they started it. So we knew they started issuing Quaker Oats before Parkhurst issued their cards, which is pretty key yeah. because and they did, they didn't want to go at the same time. And Quaker Oats is basically a redemption. So they didn't really even want the cards out in the marketplace because you had to return them. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, I think that's how uh, Quaker and, uh, and Parker's kind of set things up and say, we'll give you the license. Because remember, we talked about this earlier, Carlos, about, um, you know, they're trying to do as much as they can with with the cards because now they're uh, in competition with tops that's right. is that they're trying to utilize their license they got two teams they say okay let's sell it off to quaker roads and say okay you guys here you use our license just pay us whatever and you do your redemption thing and then we're going to come out with ours in january and you know whatever and people will collect these because it actually specifically says that uh does it not nathan that um it says only uh park only quaker roads cards are uh, admitted not not none of the parkers Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, continue. So Go ahead. That, that is, so real quick before you continue, Nathan, that, because that's a very good point that Bobby's making is that this is a key distinctor of this time period is that it wasn't like today where like you're going to do a deal with Upper Deck, Upper Deck's producing the cards for you. Maybe it's a modification or whatever, or you have a license and you're going to make a bunch of different today. If you have a license, you're making a bunch of different sets. You're coming up with all kinds of stuff. If there's a food issue, you're probably the one producing it in your factory, doing it your stuff, your way. In this case, it's kind of this loose association where it's like, here we go. We're just going to do it. <laughs> uh, you guys take a stab at it, more or less. It's like, they look pretty similar. Yeah, but, you know, use the same artifacts, basically, but you figure it out because you're going to distribute it differently. We're going to do our own thing after. We're going to do it in these packs like this, and then down the road you're like oh they must have produced everything not necessarily <laughs> not that time period so the question to you nate as, at this point would be was did did parker's produce and cut the quaker oats for quaker oats or did they do it themselves go ahead all the evidence that i've found points to the cutting process being the same uh between quaker oats and parkhurst for at least part of the production run I don't think that these cards were cut in Peterborough. I think they were cut at the location where uh, the Quaker, uh, the Parkhurst uh, cards were mostly cut, even though there's a couple of different um, distinctions in the cutting processes for the 55 set. So I would say that they, um, based and also based on an article um, that Bobby had shared with me, where the owner at the time, uh, 
George Parker, uh, George, George Kennedy, Kennedy yeah. yeah, sorry, um, had said that during this time period, uh, they had terrible quality control issues and that, you know, the, the card sheets would run away on them mm-hmm. and that uh, you get towards the left edge of the sheet and the cards would be bigger, they'd be miscut. They uh, And it was just because they were using a guillotine style cutter and then uh, they were cutting them lengthwise, um, also in a in a pretty rudimentary way. So you see all of those things show up on both the Quaker and the Parkers. The one thing that's different with the Quaker is you see a notch on the bottom, which to me is that when they package them in the Quaker Oats products, they were doing something different in Peterborough at the Quaker Oats factory that they weren't doing at the, um, in Parkers production. So I think that's where the, the shift happened. The other thing that uh, George Kennedy had said was the way that they were cutting the cards was they'd end up with stacks of each card. So then they would go put them in a cement mixer or put them in another hopper to, to mix and sort the cards. And what I'm sharing here is the sheet that is very rudimentary. I'm having a friend um, mock this up so it's not, it's not uh, it doesn't look like it was my fifth grade shop class or something. But, <laughs> You see here at the bottom, and I'll highlight this part, the three um, cards that were uh, considerably short print, like 10 to 20 of these cards exist in in the hobby, are right at the bottom left corner of the sheet. Mm-hmm. And this speaks exactly to what the article that George Kennedy was talking about, where they, they could, in 1955, take those three cards and hold them back within production. It was it was possible. They didn't do that with Parker's to our knowledge, um, but with Quaker, they most absolutely did. Uh, there is all evidence pointing to that. So what you see here then as well is that each some of these cards are really hard to find. And then you can see from the sheet why some of them are such condition sensitive issues. Like the Harry Lumley, bot- bottom left corner, or bottom right corner, that's tough. Uh, the same with some of these cards that are just single printed. Another one I'll, I'll show is this Richard Test Lumley, uh, which is always found miscut. It's always just terribly centered. And it was right at the edge on the left hand part of the sheet. And it was, again, as the, the um, cutting sloped away, it made say the Jim Thompson and the Floyd Curry have massive red borders and the Richard Tess Lumley have very s- small borders. Mm-hmm. It also affected the uh, left and right cut. So these are all things that uh, were all deduction. Like this entire sheet is uh, basically painstakingly going through and matching up each of the red borders, each of the red arrows on the back. If there's a miscut up and down, finding the miscut text of the player name on the back and linking it to the player above it. We also have found uh, that this Sid Smith on the lower left, we've found a, a Sid Smith where the red border ends and there's white underneath it, which shows very clearly that that was the the last row of Parker's cards in the sheet. We also know based on um, the sum total of the different variations that I've found that there were 121 variations. So this entire sheet is, um, is, is perhaps what it looked like. And then there was a separate sheet which started as a Quaker sheet that ended up as a Parker sheet, which uh, was exactly the same in construction, but was used in a different part of the plant um, in my in our estimation. Mm-hmm. So this is this is all stuff that I'd love to share. And uh, if there's better information, if there is an I cut sheet out there uh, that proves me wrong on this stuff, I would love to see it. Absolutely. Yeah. Carlos, I think you'll really enjoy this because there's a little bit of clandestine uh, malevolence going on here with Quaker Oats. And this was a, this was a great phrase that Bobby enjoyed throwing in there. Yeah. I, I, did, I did see that specific phrasing. Please continue. Thank you very much. Well, hey, I write it. So. It's, a good, it's, a, it's a good, listen, I'm not going to knock it. It's a good phrase. Thank you. Go for it. Uh, however, uh, that's the big thing behind this is did Quaker Oats know? So if you want to 
take it to that step, uh, Nathan, if you're finished with um, yeah. explaining the sheet. Um, and we'll get into that part of, uh, of the story, which is the most interesting, I find. I like the sound effects. That was great. That was it. good. That was, that, was, that was strong right there. So, so let's do this. We'll de we'll get into that piece for sure. Now, the one quick point I'll make based on what you were talking about as well. The whole idea of you know a food issue with something being held back. It's you know it's that kind of thing is not completely unprecedented. We know, uh, like infamously, the thirty three Gaudi set for those who are f familiar with that one. The the nap lajue. That was a that was a famous card where people got so mad that they wrote in and they're like send it out it's like we know we know it's not we know it's not in the packs because people kept checking going pack after pack that created one of the scarcities to a certain point that just to get people off their back they did issue it and send it out to people that really basically bothered them the people that really annoyed them got this card and as a result it creates one of the scarcities you know from that era you got the wagner but the lajue is one of the key pieces if you're going to put together that set because otherwise it didn't exist it wouldn't have existed probably had not enough people, you know, been there bothering people, uh, you know, gaudy about that. And that's why this kind of work is so important. It's very much like the 20s. We have the Burt Corbeau. Um, you know, all this stuff was going on back then. They didn't want to give out the prizes. Now, we don't know if there was any laws drawn. I, I think there was one drawn up in the 20s, but I think they could get around it somehow. Um, they can only give you so many prizes, although I think Quaker Oats said that they, they're not holding back anything. Yeah, but you can always do. You can always do. I don't know. I think they're I think, not. I think Bob. I think Bob. You have. You guys had the same thing. Do you remember like the McDonald's Monopoly stuff? Yes. They had all the different. It's like, and there's always the one that is like impossible to find. Yep. So you you could build entire sections of the Monopoly board, but there would be like that one piece that, that they made like five. Do you know how many fries I bought? <laughs> exactly, but so like games like that are played in all kinds of avenues and that's that's not card related that's but no that's that's a game of oh yeah put them together and then you can win the big prize blah 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 it's like yeah we made them technically they do exist good luck finding it mm -hmm. yeah and if just to jump in here you can also see in the uncut sheet what what parkhurst and quaker were thinking about when they put the sheet together so to get to redeem um the the very basic prize, uh, you had to put together a specific number of cards. Like you had to just get 10 of the same team. But to get the skates, you had to get an entire team. And then, then to get, uh, what was the other one, Bobby? The this bicycle. The bicycle. You had to get the entire set. Set. So the uh, Harry Lumley fits with the, the uh, Toronto team. Uh, so you needed the, to complete the Toronto team. You needed um, that Harry Lumley, which is, which is impossible. If you wanted to get skates and you were a Habs fan you and you collected the Habs, you would need the Rocket Richard. And that was also really tough. Mm -hmm. And then if you wanted uh, the bike, you would need all three. All and, three. and so the King Clancy was the hardest uh, of the 79 to find then because it was the a linchpin for the biggest prize. You also see in the set that there are many more Montreal Canadiens that are double printed than um, than Toronto Maple Leafs. We have lines here of uh, like Tim Horton, Willie Marshall, Lauren Shabbat, um, and then this line of uh, Harvey Jackson, Ace Bailey, uh, Chuck Conacher, Maple Leaf Gardens, Harold Cotton, and then on the top, uh, we have Sweeney Shiner, Dick Duff, Jack Caffrey. These cards were all single printed. Mm -hmm. And so it would have been harder for a child in the Quaker Oats set to get a, a full team of, Mont of Toronto Maple Leafs. It would have been much easier for them to get Montreal Canadiens. And that played to the market dynamics uh, in the time where there were, I would imagine, many more uh, kids looking for Toronto Maple Leafs than, than Montreal Canadiens. Yeah, it would have been population demographics on that part. Yeah, easily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and so then, go ahead, go ahead, then uh, um, well, then Parkers just didn't change it for the Parker set. They just kept it. <laughs> makes sense. Bob, go ahead. Yeah, I think you had a question. So, were were there a checklist? How did one know if they had a complete team set or or whatnot? Bobby, do you want to take that? Um. 
there was no checklist then in 1955. There wasn't a checklist until 61, I think, um, uh, in cards, in hockey cards. Uh, uh, with that, uh, I think they said cards numbered 1 to 20. I, think I was about to say, in the I advertisement. Think in that, yeah, in that era, you would have done it, uh, Bob, where the, where the same team are sequentially numbered up until a certain point. Yeah. So you so that would make your life a little bit easier because you could be like, okay, so I'm starting with card number one, and you go up until how many? You keep going until you run out of players on card twenty or twenty one. Yeah, hmm. it did state on the advertisement, but I said it, it. I think it said whatever it was, you know, twenty cards, so both to Toronto and Montreal or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah. You know, but so. in that case, once you basically hit a Montreal Canadian, so if it's card number twenty-two, you knew that you were good at twenty-one from Maple Leafs, and then Montreal Canadians would go from twenty-two on. Yeah, one to twenty, and then twenty to forty, and then the other ones were all the correct, correct legends and stuff, all time. What have you? Yeah, like so action bad. shots. What have you? Correct. Yeah, and I think for uh, for also for the hobby, the Jacques Plante is the key card in uh, the set for as far as value, and it's a Hall of Fame rookie. Mm -hmm. And it does only appear once on the 121 card sheet, and it's here uh, inverted on a row that you most always see it um, cut very close to the text. Um, but it is very close to some really difficult uh, cards to find in high grade. So the Sloan and McPherson and the Richard Test Lumley, those are all really difficult. The Joe Primo is uh, appears four times uh, on the sheet, uh, or uh, twice on the 121 card sheet. So it's a bit easier to find. It's also down here. So just to, just for the, the those who are just interested in that, that big name, um, there's a reason why that's a tough card. That makes and, sense. That and makes it's in sense. his rookie year with the uh, plant that's unbelievable yeah yeah that makes it an iconic card and mm. a very rare variant of an iconic card you kind of stack that on top of each other you make it really tough yes mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely so from here any other uh, key pieces you guys want to hit on here uh yeah we can get into uh a little bit of what went on with quaker oats um uh if you want to take that nathan or it's up to you uh, uh with regards to how many you know what to go okay go ahead Oh, are you talking about the prizes? Yes. Yeah. So uh, this is this is this is great. This is uh, just fascinating hobby lore as well. For whatever reason, uh, Quaker Oats was mandated to uh, share publicly the list of people who won prizes. They they didn't share who won bikes and who won skates, but they did share the list of winners of one or the two. Um, and they did this over a period of three separate um, uh, pages uh, that were released at different times. It so happens that for the first year of the promotion, I believe 75% of all winners came within a 60 kilometer radius of Peterborough, Ontario. That happens to be where the Quaker Oats, Oats plant is and where these cards were packaged. So that's completely legit. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, of course I know. <laughs> and so it did even out, uh, not even out, but it did get a little bit better over the the, the second phase of the reporting, mm -hmm. where there were more people in more places. But still, uh, over the course of the entire promotion, I believe there were 600 um, prizes that were given out, and uh, I think it's something like around 400 of them were within 60 kilometers of, of uh, Peterborough. There were a lot of angry people and uh, a lot of letters and Bobby has uh, some of this correspondence. So in the end, uh, this is another reason why Quaker Oats is so tough to find. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a end of promotion promotion. Send any card that you've collected and write your name and your address on the back or the front of that card on each one of those Quaker Oats cards. Send them to us. We will put them in a big bin and we'll draw 100 prizes. 100 bicycles. 100 bicycles. This all seems like a lot of work when all you had to do was get Carlos Sr. to sell chocolate bars. You know? <laughs> I thought we established this. Like, guys, it's real easy. Work smarter, not harder. I don't understand. I don't understand. This was just foolishness on their part. Please continue. Yeah, and so uh, what happened then is that the, 
the 100 winners of those bicycles were also publicly uh, available. Mm-hmm. Right. I believe two of those 100 were within 60 kilometer radius of Peterborough, Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> Take the odds out. Look at what happens. <laughs> so it was something that captured the imagination of Canadians. It was also something that uh, most likely has a very great story um, that uh, hopefully some people in the Peterborough area are, area are alive and willing to tell. Mm-hmm. So there's still a lot of work to be done on uh, on this set and really getting the nuance and the uh, the great stories out of it that um, that are there. Sure. That was going to be my kind of my follow-up question there because it's obviously, and I, I want to commend you uh, for doing this great research. So, like that's painstaking. Taking the pieces and literally rebuilding a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, (laughs) rebuilding a jigsaw puzzle, so to speak, to try to reconstruct something with no guide. You're just trying to like find common elements. That's a lot of work. That is a lot of work. That that is why some people would allegedly have others do work for them in previous (laughs) stories uttered tonight. But the point is that it takes painstaking work. And it is an old, you know, we have the modern technologies, which is wonderful, but it is an old school way of doing it, like reaching out to people, getting this little piece of information, putting it together, this piece of information, getting it all together, and then working from there. And so based on what you have done already, and again, I commend you for it, um, outside of maybe finding if finding if some people in Peterborough maybe have some additional information to give, if someone down the road can maybe shed some light on some specifics, maybe correct it if, if the sheet needs to be corrected. What are you looking for? What is it that you're, uh, that obviously you're very interested, you wouldn't put this much work into it if you weren't, but what are you looking for as far as continuing your work down this path? Well, I'm, I'm in the midst of, of writing an article on this um, with, and Bobby and I will uh, basically co-author this. Also, I've got a graphic designer friend who is going to um, put this all together nicely uh, so the way that it may have appeared, also with the back. Um, and then um, I also just would love to have conversations about just what we're seeing with you know these cards out there in the hobby. Um, there's uh, part of the reasons why I did this is because I was in the dark with buying mm-hmm. Parkhurst cards. I, I'd love to have public information out there so that people can really make informed decisions about when, when they're, what they're buying and, and how it should look because uh, um, there's a whole lot of alteration that happens and it doesn't just come from one place and it doesn't just go to one place. Mm-hmm. But if there is, if somebody's like, Hey, what should I be looking for? Um, you know, I'd love to be able to just provide that information to the hobby so that other people out there who are wanting to get in on this but don't want to get burned um, can at least have uh, some constructive advice on how to do it and also see where, what should happen. If, a, if you have, say, uh, a Rocket Richard and it's terribly miscut on the back, uh, it's always going to have King Clancy's uh, red arrow there. Mm-hmm. The, the, and that type of information, um, I think, is going to really help with consumers make better decisions about buying these cards, and I think makes the hobby a safer place. Yeah, so, and additionally to that, um, you know, we found that, uh, or Nathan found that, you know, the arrow on the one side and it had a little piece on the other side. Sometimes that piece is not there, which technically cannot happen. So, however you want to come to that conclusion, is that is out there. Mm-hmm. And some are graded. Yeah. So there's yeah. some. Uh, so there is some more. There is some more work oh, to be done. More. But yeah. but there is. But there is at least a foundation now. That's the beauty of coming up with theories and putting together the information. Is that then if somebody wants to disprove it, then you can have that conversation and maybe it leads down a different path that you didn't even consider until you had that other piece of information. Right. Yeah. And the and just to, to, the the wrinkle in this and the thing that I have been told by others is that well you know some had red arrows and some didn't. So there were 54 of the cards that were active player cards that had red arrows um, that were on the horizontal backs. Mm -hmm. And then there were uh, 37 that didn't. Uh, And and so say this Sylvia Mantha and Battleship Leduc and Bob Turner, none of them had would have an arrow left to right. It was up and down. Mm -hmm. So even if this Sylvia Mantha is miscut left to right, it will it won't ever have a miscut red arrow on the right, it would have start to have battleship Leduc's um, text. So there, that is the nuance where people get away with it: is that there's some cards in the set 
that don't conform uh, to the simple thing that I talked about with Rocket Richard. And that's why I just, you know, this hobby isn't always for people who want to go down the last rabbit hole to, to really find out what they're, what they're working on. Some people just want to look at nice cards, but I think there's also a, um, just to help the, the integrity of it. But then it's all just also to me, this has always been really cool. Like I love, I love finding out information about sets that I've liked for a long time, and I, you know, the Habs are my team, and I, I just really, um, you know, Rocket Richard and Jean Beliveau, these are people that I grew up uh, really idolizing, and so it would, it's just great to to be able to spend time with that as a hobbyist and learn some new things that that I don't think other people know. Very nice. Very nice. And I'm it's very subtle, did... but we might be able to tell that you are somewhat passionate about this. It, it, it's you have to really look underneath the surface, but we're getting a, we're getting a bit of a sense of it. <laughs> and it's it's fun sharing with people who have the same passion as I do with so many other things. It's really actually fun talking with somebody and sharing that same level of uh, dedication. And uh, you know, this isn't something I would have pursued by myself, but uh, when he asked me to help, yeah, I gave him whatever I could, and and it really helped bring it together a little bit better. And now we have a better thought process of this set and what goes on and what had went on. Now we still, the nefarious part of this with is the Quaker Oat question. It's not even, it, it's hands down, there was something going on there. Uh, that's why they offered the 100 bikes at the end. So it's nice discovering that. It makes for a great story and it's basically the truth. Well, we so, always knew if we really, if you ever look at that logo, that Quaker looks a little shifty. There was yeah. a, he, he, he doesn't seem like a trustworthy dude. You just, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I know. He seems like he knows a little too much is what I'm saying. I've seen, I've seen that logo a, th a time or two, a time or two, for yeah. sure. Kind of Shakespeare-ish, you know, a lot of controversy. Anyway. Just, just, just saying, like, I don't know if you can trust <laughs> that guy. But no, that well, was uh, some phenomenal work, Nathan. So any, any, any like wrap up uh, thoughts here that we'll get into that? Or is that kind of, uh, you know, work in progress, still looking for that additional information, still working on it. You got your article that you're going to start authoring as you go along to take some of this information and build off of it. Yeah, no, the, I think the last part of it is just um, around the, the real short prints of the, of the set and sure. uh, the Quaker Oat set. And there's been a long debate about whether or not those three cards were printed separately or if they were printed with the sheet. Mm -hmm. I think all evidence shows that they're printed with the sheet. And that is a, a relatively uh, controversial conversation for those that collect uh, Quakers. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think I've got the evidence now to prove that they, they were just separated at birth, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were Very on the nice. sheet. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. No, that's good stuff. So what I'll say is this. Pleasure meeting you. First time I've had the chance to talk to you directly. Love the work that you did. I got a chance to read that the article information that Bobby sent me so I could have a little background so I kind of knew at least where conceptually where you were going. But this is some really great research. And this is some phenomenal work that you've definitely put a lot of time into. So I want to congratulate you on that. Wish you the best of luck in continuing to go forward. And I'd love to chat and correspond. And hopefully you keep making progress. Thanks. Thanks so much, Carlos. Thanks for having me. And great to meet you, Bob. And good to see you, yeah, Bobby. Well Thanks, Nathan. I won't tell you the score. Sounds yeah. good. I'll leave, we'll leave right. you to go. We'll leave you to go check out the game and find out for yourself. Okay. Thank Thanks. you for popping Bye. in. I appreciate you. Thanks, yeah. Nathan. Bye. Bye. Bye.